Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, I have a difficult task because the three papers before me were very rich and very complex. I'm not a political scientist and I'm not a sociologist. I'm a literary scholar. And I was attempting to read the papers and I read all of them completely and to see what kind of connections I can make, what kind of historical and literary analogs I can provide as a stimulus for discussion. What I saw from the very beginning was a kind of connecting thread, uh, beginning with Bohdan Kordan's paper where he talks about the legitimacy of the new Ukrainian government. Um, I think that this is very important because from the very outset of the Euromaidan revolution, and I'm talking here already the first week of, of December, we see a concerted effort to delegitimize what is going on the Maidan. And I believe it was on the 8th of uh, December when a group of people broke away from the Maidan they went to the president's administration building, and there were some provocateurs who had brought in a tractor. And they created a very unpleasant kerfuffle, which involved the police beating people. And immediately the next day, Vladimir Putin said that those Ukrainians had organized a real pogrom uh, on the Maidan. The journalists who were out to get um, to see excitement didn't see the thousands and thousands of people who were peacefully on the Maidan. They focused on this uh, struggle in front of the president's uh, administration. And immediately uh, when the YouTube videos of this situation uh, were posted, it was obvious that it was a provocation because the leader standing on the tractor was Korczynski, a man who has connections with Dugin, and his group And I, uh, was led by an unidentified man wearing a white cap, and he was given a corridor through the police ranks in order to run away as the police began attacking the protesters. So the concept that Ukrainians were organizing a fascist pogrom was already a, um, a prepared text. This is the, the manner in which Putin and his entourage were going to fight the Maidan. Uh, the uh, Bohdan mentions in his paper that basically, uh, over and beyond the search for Europe, this is a war against imperial ambitions. And the people on the Maidan, especially the students, had a collective producing posters, many of which I had uh, put up in the back of the room. And one of the posters produced, not today, but the previous two days and, and during uh, Andriy Kurkov's presentation, one of the posters, which was produced very early uh, during the, uh, the revolution, was this particular poster, which depicts Yanukovych uh, in, as a Vitenanka, as a Ukrainian folk uh, cutout uh, art, but the uh, image around the nose and the eyes basically hints at the, well, depicts the two-headed eagle of the Russian Empire. So the protesters from the very beginning were aware that they were not fighting Yanukovych alone. They were fighting the empire, which was striking back. Uh, the idea of the right to self-defense, which in Bohdan Kordan's thesis, legitimizes the new government. Maybe we can close this. Okay. 
is an important one, and I wholeheartedly concur with the thesis, and I would like to state that it has a long history in Ukrainian culture. Um, when we have, and I'm going to take you back to the end of the 16th, the beginning of the 17th century, when the, there is a vertical integration of Ukrainian society, when we have the Ukrainian hierarchy, Ukrainian scholars, tradesmen, guildsmen, getting together to create a new educational system borrowed from the West, and here I will take, um, make a little footnote, the quest to be part of Europe is not new. We have it already in the Middle Ages with the kinds of literary choices that Yaroslav the Wise makes and the manner in which he constructs his Cathedral of Wisdom. It gets repeated at the end of the 16th century when there is a need to counter local corruption in the Orthodox Church. And you have a vertical integration of the Orthodox educated clergy and the scholars and Prince Ostrowski and the Cossacks producing a new educational system which gradually introduces the Neo-Latin educational system. It is within this system that Ukrainians import a completely different cultural model than the one they inherited from Byzantium. And this model is Ciceronian rhetoric, which is a republican ideal of organizing society and one that maintains that the legitimacy of government depends on the mutual and reciprocal responsibilities between monarch and his subjects. And this is a recurring theme that we will find in Ukrainian literature throughout the 17th and even the 18th century. Uh, to move on to Taras uh, Kuzia's paper, which is very important because it brings to the fore social information about the social structure of the people conducting the counter-revolution in the Donbass and focuses on the nature of organized crime in there, I would like to come make the following comments. We have, uh, on the one hand, a lot of xenophobia and racism to cite Taras Kuzio himself, and this xenophobia and racism is not something that was invented recently. As a matter of fact, let me find my notes. Xenophobic and racist material have been appearing since at least 2005. In 2005, Grigory Savitsky published uh, Battlefield Ukraine, The Broken Trident, uh, Trident, which depicts a scenario uh, where you have orange Nazis fighting, uh, conducting a civil war in Ukraine and unleashing a genocide against the Russian-speaking population. Another example of this type of literature is uh, uh, actually a forerunner was the novel Omega by the veteran science fiction writer Andrei Valentino. And in it he talks about a pro-Western orange revolution and he gives alternative versions of what happened in 2004. And he talks about the dystopia in which Crimea uh, a, a, a dystopian which Crimea hasn't been invaded and occupied by NATO forces in 1995. If you have been following current events, then you realize that what is described in these novels is very prescient of what is taking place uh, here. There's another novel by Bobrov, um, 
uh, and another novel by Berezin. I'm not going to go into details because I don't want to. Uh, you have the covers here. One is from 2006. The other one uh, appeared in 2009 and 2010. And if you carefully read these novels, the scenarios that are being developed today in the Dubas and the Crimea are all there. Uh, as a matter of fact, Avako at one point commented that it is frightening to see these things coming out in print. And I have focused only on the material published in Donbass, in Donetsk and Luhansk. There are dozens of novels and plays and films produced in Russia proper with um, a similar vocabulary, uh, which, which I would say promotes a discourse of hatred and depicts Ukrainians as Nazis and fascists who are introducing a genocide against the Russians. Now, uh, another aspect of uh, Taras Kuzia's paper, which I found very interesting, is that a recent um, report, uh, which appeared in, uh, which was published by Yuri Makarov, a Bulgarian-born publicist and the former editor of Ukrainsky Tizhdeng, um, and this appeared only a week and a half ago, very recently, uh, but it appeared before I received Taras's paper. And he states the following. Today's Russia does not have anything to do in common with Russia, which, once upon, which the Russia, which once upon a time produced Rachmaninoff's piano con uh, concert, Turgenev's Asia, and such writers as Mrishkovsky and Bloch. In today's Russia, according to sociological research, recent sociological research, 40% of the adult population profess a criminal or near criminal subculture. They like this type of culture. And this is why when Putin or Lavrov and Churkin in their private circles use statements, and I'm not going to quote, which belong to the, to, to the criminal vocabulary, these Russians like that kind of discourse. Um, let me turn now to uh, Professor Vinitsky's very rich paper and one that will take a lot of time to process. Um, I was very impressed by the concept of the national, the bourgeois and the postmodern, and I offered the following com comments. Um, and here we come back to the idea of legitimacy again. Um, Professor Vinnitsky legitimizes the idea of national identity by implicitly indicating that this new national identity is political. And he cites the Armenian, the Belarusian, and the Jewish participants on the Maidan. I can add to his examples the Jewish boys who died and are part of the celestial unit, the celestial hundred. Uh, I can mention the very orthodox uh, soldier, Cherkaski, who has photographs on Facebook playing, uh, celebrating Purim with his children, and he uh, sports a very orthodox beard. And at the same time, he meets with the leader of the right sector. Um, basically, what is implicit in this paper is that we have to avoid labels. The Russian propaganda has used old labels and assumed that it is enough to call these people rightists or fascists simply because they wear a red and black flag. I think Mikhail Vinitsky has given us a good indication that these symbols have been appropriated by a new generation with a completely different meaning. And this is where the cultural anthropologists can come in 
and conduct field work to find out what these symbols mean for these people. In the film, The Winter That Changed Us, which was produced by Vavilon Trenatyek, a young man speaking in Russian, wearing a beret and a red and black trident says, I have no idea who Bandera is. But for me, this is a symbol of resistance. Now, uh, I will, uh, and I concur with the identity shift that has been outlined in, in this paper. I just want to come back to the 17th century. And that's why technology doesn't work with me all the time, because I live in a different period. Um, it was mentioned that we have a kind of combination of the individual and the collective. And I would like to draw your attention to a famous poem written by the monk, an Orthodox monk who wrote in Polish and in Latin and in Church Slavonic and wrote poetry in Ruthenian that is in the Middle Belarusian and Middle Ukrainian language. He wrote this poem for his students to proclaim on April 28, May 8, according to the old calendar in 1622, upon uh, the exequies of Hetman uh, Sahaidachny. And I will quote the two segments. The loyalty of subjects toward their rulers secures for them the most important gift among human beings. I judge that, among all, the most important thing is liberty. To which, when juxtaposed, ranks seeds, rank seeds its place. So rank is not as important as liberty. All creatures that by nature aspire toward freedom can attest to my claim. Golden liberty, so they call it. All diligently attempt to attain it, yet it cannot be granted to everyone, but only to those who defend the fatherland and the ruler. Now, may I remind you that the ruler is an elected king, not a hereditary king. Knights attain it in wars with their courage. They purchase it not with money, but with blood. This oration is basically the Key of Mohila, the future Key of Mohila Academy's manifesto against the current king who had sent Sahaidachni to fight a war in Khotin unnecessarily, and Sahaidachni gets wounded and dies. And the Cossacks, the Saporosian host, is very upset for this abuse of the situation. So they're paying honor to their deceased as a Porosian uh, leader, the very man who funded the confraternity school which gave rise to the Cave Mohila Academy. But at the same time, they use this very long oratorial uh, poem based on all the laws of Cicero's Republican rhetoric to remind the king that if he does not respect their rights, he will lose his own legitimacy. In another segment, um, they talk about the culture of sacrifice. The Cossack not having arms or a, hem or a, hamlet, a helmet frequently endangers his own health, just so that the captive may be released. And this image, I've thought about it so very often when I saw these people fighting on the Maidan without the appropriate tools for defending themselves and very poor casks and so forth. But I will, not, I will add one more thing in order to talk. I've, I've addressed the question of self-sacrifice. But there's one more point that I want to make, um, and I didn't have a time to put it here, is that the dead hetman addresses the entire Zaporozhian host and all the students of the Kiev Mohila Academy in this particular poem. And he instructs them 
to work collectively to defend the individual rights of every Cossack, of every student, and also to protect his widow. So the collective becomes responsible for the individual. I'm not saying that this is exactly the culture that you have identified. I'm only prov providing an analog, a historical kind of background to the kind of relationships that I saw uh, and the disturbing problems with the racist hatred of discourse coming out from Donbass and from Russia. Thank you.